one's already marked up. So I will be using this one again. And if you're, if you're coming on Wednesday nights, it's familiar to you. If you're not coming, I encourage you to either come or catch the Wednesday study online. We are in Ephesians. We are moving through Ephesians at a lightning pace. Uh, we are moving so fast through Ephesians that there was actually a slug out in the parking lot that was struggling to keep up. So that's how fast we are going. And today I'm going to be reading actually, actually part way through verse 8 on into 10. I mentioned on Wednesday that if you're looking at Ephesians chapter 1 right now, verse 3 through verse 14 is one sentence in the Greek. When, when Paul wrote this, he just wrote one very long compound sentence. And so it's a little bit hard for us to punctuate, and um, some translators have, have punctuated it differently than others. In, in my opinion, which ain't that great, but in my opinion, I think that we need to start uh, a new sentence in the English about halfway through verse 8, which is where I'm going to come in. And it goes like this. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. Let's stop and pray, and we'll take a look at that magnificent section today. Lord, how I thank you that you have brought us together in you even this morning. Now, Lord, there is much that we don't know, and we look to you to teach us, not to me. And there's much that we are not, and we look to you to make us today. So will you lead us, I pray, and teach us today as we look into this. We thank you, Lord. Amen. As many of you know, Pastor Jerry, our superintendent, our district superintendent, has cancer. This is the man who serves as the pastor to the pastors on this district. He's the leader of, gosh, I don't even know how many churches are on WAPAC now, 80 some odd churches, more than that. He is the, the leader, the, the theological gatekeeper, the one who uh, sets the direction for the district, uh, the one who oversees the training of new ministers, the one who makes sure that there are uh, quality pastors in each of the various churches. It's Pastor Jerry. It's a big job, and he's a great guy. I remember when Wendy had cancer, Pastor Jerry, who lives in Olympia, by the way, that's where his office is, he managed to work things out to come to our house one afternoon to pray for Wendy, to sit with us for a little bit and pray for Wendy. Our house is in Mount Vernon. Pastor Jerry is in Olympia, and he worked it out to come all that way for a 15-minute visit just to be an encouragement to us. That was pretty cool. He did the same for Pastor Craig Laughlin, who is the pastor at the Marysville Church. Pastor Craig, a few years ago, contracted an incredibly aggressive type of cancer that apparently people just don't survive. I mean, basically, the doctor told him, go home and pack your bags. And the people gathered around and prayed for Pastor Craig. And he's one of, of like, it's like a 0.04% uh, cure rate. And he is, he is in that 0.04%. And everybody, nobody in the, in the Cancer Alliance here that's based out of Seattle that goes up and down our area, nobody had ever seen anybody survive this kind of cancer. And he not only survived it, but it's gone. And Pastor Jerry came and prayed with him and supported him quite a bit. And now Pastor Jerry has cancer. And I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but he is not doing well. He's not tolerating the treatment very well at all. We had a big meeting on Tuesday, and it's, it's a district meeting that he just really loves. It's a particular district board that has to do with the raising up of new ministers that's just deep in Pastor Jerry's heart. He absolutely loves this. I have never seen him miss any of it. He has such enthusiasm for it, and he was actually planning on coming to that meeting even in the midst of his treatment, but uh, things had really taken a turn for worse for him uh, on Monday afternoon as he was trying to prepare for this Tuesday meeting, and he ended up back in the hospital and missed that meeting for the first time in his career. You're not doing well, and, and that stinks. Cancer is an incredibly horrendous thing, 
Cancer basically takes the order that the cells in your body are in and creates disorder. It takes the natural order of a cell and turns it into chaos. And as that, that cell reproduces, rather than reproducing new ordered cells, it produces more chaos. And that's, that's what rots the body. And this is what Pastor Jerry is dealing with. What do we do about that? Well, back in 1941, these people, the Laskers, are their names, the Laskers, Albert and, I can't remember her name off the top of my head right now, I want to say it was Mary Lasker, they started an organization, the Lasker Foundation, that funded what became the American Cancer Society by 1943. They were so uh, involved in cancer research, so personally touched by cancer issues, that they started this organization and, and, and have personally committed, in today's dollars, billions of, funds, billions of dollars in funds to the research and the study of cancer and cancer treatment. And they had a goal of increasing both quality of life and uh, survi uh, survival of, of various different types of cancers. And the American Cancer Society, of course, has gone on to do tremendous work. One of the most fantastic things that the American Cancer Society did was culminated by Richard Nixon in 1971. You might remember Richard Nixon started the War on Cancer in 1971, signing the American Cancer Act, which started a number of things, including a, a, a few government-funded foundations that funded cancer. It committed, in today's dollars, billions of dollars toward cancer treatment. This was all predicated by an ad in the New York Times that said, Mr. Nixon, you can cure cancer. They said, if you will dedicate enough of American scientific minds and American scientific funding toward the research and the study of cancer, then we know that it can be cured in our lifetime. It led to what's known as the Nixon moonshot of 1971. You remember, in 1961, JFK gave the moonshot, the literal moonshot. We're going to make it to the moon, put a man on the moon, and bring him home safely in this decade. Well, people said to Nixon, this is your moonshot. And so, in 1971, Nixon said that in his lifetime, we would eradicate cancer. In his lifetime, because of the work of the war on cancer, that it would be removed from us as a society, as a people, as a world, in his lifetime. Richard Nixon died in 1994. He had a stroke, and four days later, he died. In 1994, over half a million people died of cancer. That was a significant, in significant increase over the amount of people that died directly related to cancer in 1971. It actually got worse, not better. And in 2023, almost three-quarters of a million people died directly related to cancer. It didn't work. It didn't work. If it had, Pastor Jerry wouldn't have cancer today. Mr. Nixon couldn't cure cancer. Cells in the body are still going from order to chaos. It stinks. It really stinks. Some of you might know that I like to watch Star Trek. Now, I don't, I don't have the kind of time that I used to have to invest in just watching TV shows, but Star Trek has always been a favorite since I was a kid. I have watched every episode of the original series so many times that most of them I have memorized. When we occasionally will turn on an original series episode, like within the first 10 seconds, I'll tell Wendy, oh yeah, I like this one. Because, because I, I know them all. I've watched every episode of The Next Generation, most of them multiple times. There are some that are really favorites. I think, I think Brett Spinner, who played Data, should have won an Emmy Award for some of that stuff. That was amazing acting and a, and a pretty incredible series, a pretty incredible show. I've watched DS9, I've watched Voyager, I've watched Discovery, which was not necessarily my favorite. I, I started to watch the new series, uh, uh, Strange New Worlds. That's really good, but I, I just don't have much time, and so I haven't been able to watch too much of it, but I really enjoy this, and, and my hope 
my, my honest hope is that one day, after God has recreated all this, and all creation has been redeemed, and he starts handing out jobs to his servants, that maybe he'll let me be a starship captain, and I'll get to go out and explore all of these fantastic worlds that he's made. I think that would just be wonderful. I do have one huge problem, though, with the whole Star Trek series, with the whole Star Trek universe. I have a problem, and really my problem is not with Captain Picard or, or William T. Riker. My, my problem is with Gene Roddenberry, who started the series. You see, in the late 50s, Gene Roddenberry, late 1950s, Gene Roddenberry had this idea that humanity would evolve in such a way that by the middle of the 22nd century, which would be the 2100s, that we would evolve ourselves out of things like greed. And that as a result, within a generation, we would eradicate all poverty off of this planet. We would eradicate all war off of this planet. We would become a people, a singular planetary people that would work together with common goals. Now granted, this is necessary to have the funding to build something like the Enterprise, but, but he had this idea that we would just basically evolve as society and get better and better and better. And you know, if you think about the late 1950s, you can kind of see where that came from. I mean, World War II, this horrible thing, but, but we dealt with it. We eradicated the evil of World War II, right, here in America. And as a result, everything's just getting better and better and better. Education is better. Health care is better. U.S. national highway system, come on. It's getting so good. And so he just knew, he just knew that things were just getting better. Problem is, by the time the original series was wrapping up in 1967, it became pretty obvious that things weren't actually getting better. The, the tremendous uh, optimism of the late 1950s was squashed in the tremendous tr struggle of the late 1960s until we realized things aren't going uphill, they're actually still going downhill, and at a faster rate than they were before. And all of the people of our society begin to agree on this concept that it's all leading toward a grand conclusion, and it's not going to be a good one. And so if you look at the, the Star Trek concept that developed out of that, it came down to this. Humanity is going down so fast that one day there will be a tremendous nuclear desolation of the world and, and almost no one will survive, but those that do survive will know better. And they're never going to let that happen again. And that's why humanity is improving. I got news for you. That's just not. That's just not. It's just not getting better. And I don't care what country you're in, what society you go and hang out with, whether they're Eastern Communist Bloc countries, whether they're what we refer to as third world countries, or whether it's right here on the streets of the United States, every person that you meet in the world is carrying in their heart this concept that it's all going downhill faster and faster and that it's all coming to an end. And it is causing tremendous anxiety. Have you ever seen, any of you who study history, have you ever seen where politicians are being turned over faster in the history of the world? Because it's time to an elect a new politician. And we say, this guy can fix it. Let's vote for this guy. He can fix it all. And so we vote for this guy. And it doesn't matter how good of a job or how bad of a job he does. He can't fix it. And it becomes brutally obvious within months that it's going to be no different with this guy than it was with that guy. And so now we hate this guy because we were depending on him to fix it. Turns out he can't. Let's vote the bum out and get a new one. Everybody can see where it's going and nobody knows what to do about it. And I got to admit, it really stinks and it feels incredibly hopeless. But not for you. Not for the Christian. It is not hopeless for the Christian. And I'll tell you why. 
Because with all wisdom and prudence, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth. This is one of the most tremendous blessings of God. It's laid out for us in Ephesians, right in a big section where Paul is detailing for us our blessings that we have received in the heavenlies, in Christ Jesus, that are available for us to be used at our hands right now, today. Here is a kind of a list of them. First of all, he blessed us in this way. He chose us. He said, you guys get to be included in my plan. You guys who believe in me, you guys who are in Christ, you guys who have surrendered the old life and who have chosen to become new in Christ, you guys are chosen, you're included in my plan. Not only did he choose us, he adopted us. Adoption, remember, is not entry into the family. Adoption is your position within the family. You are adopted as sons. You take the spot of the firstborn son, the heir, the one who has the power and authority in the kingdom. You are given in that spot and this is because of this other blessing where he lavished on us his grace that term lavished means he poured out so much that we can't even count it if it was anything other than grace it would be smothering us but because it's grace we are living in it this grace is unmerited favor he chose us he adopted us because he loves us so much not because of anything we've done or how good we are but because of how good he is he actually sees us with his goodness and not our brokenness not only that he redeemed us that is he purchased us for his purposes never to be sold again and that purpose was to set us free so that we can be free in him he forgave us that doesn't mean he saw that we weren't that great and he just kind of oh ho, ho, i'm not going to look at that it means that he saw how not great we were and realized the seriousness of the debt that we had gotten ourselves into and it was so serious that he himself was the only one who could pay it and so he paid it for us and then he made known to us his will which we're going to talk about today he gave us an inheritance which is absolutely ludicrous and we're going to talk about that on wednesday and he sealed us protected us put his ownership stamp on us and we'll talk about that maybe wednesday if we get far enough the absolute incredible blessings of god i want to talk about this one this morning he made known to us his will with all wisdom and prudence he made known to us the mystery of his will with all wisdom and prudence let's just work through these words for a moment prepare to have your mind blown with all wisdom and prudence a guy by the name of rt russell who is a great bible commentator from a long time ago a couple hundred years ago he defined these terms this way wisdom the knowledge that sees into the heart of things which knows them as they truly are i like that definition of wisdom i would say this is the kind of knowledge that truly sees the biggest of the big picture and the smallest of the small picture. This is beyond just knowing the facts. This is understanding the facts within all of their contexts. Everything from the highest eye view to the most microscopic. A complete and total understanding beyond anything that you and I might be able to gain from our perspective. Beyond anything that we might be able to gain from our viewpoint, get into the U-2 spy plane, go as high as we can, look down. Grab one of those electron microscopes, get that thing dialed in as much as we can, look deep inside. Beyond any of that level of understanding, God sees it in its absolute, total entirety. Wisdom. And prudence. An understanding which leads to the right action. You see, he sees things in a way that we could never see. He understands things in a way that we could never understand them. He has a grasp on things that just are, are, are totally beyond our ability to comprehend. But, but he's got the whole thing. He's got it all sitting there in front of him. And not only that, but he has an understanding of that. You ever looked at anything, pulled it all apart, you could put it back together, that's fine, but you still had no idea how the thing worked? He has an understanding of how it all fits together in such a tremendous and fascinating, fantastic way that he knows what to do about it. So he not only sees the whole thing, he also knows what the right action is to do about it. 
with all wisdom and prudence, with that level of understanding, and with a tremendous desire to do the right thing on our behalf. Remember, this is blessing for us. So with that level of understanding and with a desire to do the right thing on our behalf, here is what he did. He made known to us the mystery of his will. Let's break it down. He made known to us the mystery of his will. He made known to us. It literally is the word revealed. He revealed to us. My dad tells me the story about 1961, in August of 1961, he was watching the TV. You remember the TV show, My Three Sons? He's watching My Three Sons, 1961, little boy sitting in front of his TV set. And one, I can't remember the youngest son's name. Anybody remember? I don't remember. I, I haven't seen that show since it was in reruns and I was a kid. The little boy and his friend, the one from down the street, they would always ride their bikes together on the show. I don't remember. Anyway, they rode their bikes down to the Chevy dealer because Chevrolet sponsored My Three Sons. And there on the showroom floor of the Chevy dealer was the brand new 1962 Chevrolet Impala. But it had not yet been released to the public. Nobody knew what it was going to look like. And remember back in those days, they looked different every year. This was a major deal. What's the new Chevy Impala going to look like in 1962? It's August of 61, and they won't tell us. And on the show... The two little boys snuck in to the, the showroom and they snuck up to the back corner of this 62 Chevy Impala that's covered completely with a car cover. They sneak up behind it and they're telling each other, this is the new 62 Chevy Impala. I wonder what it looks like. And they look around to make sure nobody's looking and they grab the corner and they peel it up and they show the quarter panel of the car and it's beautiful. It's gorgeous, unlike anything anyone's ever seen before. Just that rear quarter panel. And by the way, 62 Chevys are particularly attractive. And my dad, he says, as a little boy, his eyes just popped open. He'd never seen anything like this. It was a tremendous revealing. Up to this point, it was totally hidden. But now, it has been at least partially revealed. That's what this is. He revealed, he pulled the cover back on the mystery. The word is musterion in Greek. We have just transliterated, transliterated into English. Now, you guys know what a mystery is, right? Agatha Christie, murder she wrote, who done it? It was the butler. You gotta read the whole book to find out who did it. That's not, that's, that's not what the original Greek musterion meant. It didn't mean this is something that you must solve. It didn't mean that this is something where if you gather enough clues and you study enough evidence, you'll eventually figure this out. That's not what musterion means. What musterion means is it's something that used to not be known, something that used to be hidden, that was at a particular time for a particular purpose revealed to a particular group of people. Musterion is always uh, connected to a verb in the aorist tense, which means there was a specific moment of time where it started, and it's gone on from there. Musterion. He revealed to us the mystery. The mystery of his will. See, listen. Adam didn't know how it was all going to turn out. Adam and Eve in the garden, Genesis chapter 3, there's going to be a man crushed the head of the serpent. Hmm, interesting. I don't even know what that means. You get to Genesis chapter 4, they made a very wrong decision based on what they thought that meant. They didn't see the whole thing. Hadn't been revealed to them. Genesis chapter 5, that list of names that gives us the gospel message, they didn't know. They didn't know how it was going to work out. Abraham didn't know how it was going to work out. Joseph down there in Egypt had no idea how it was going to eventually work out. When Moses led the, the Israelites through the Red Sea, he didn't know how it was all going to come together. Joshua didn't have a clue. Isaiah wrote Isaiah 53, half of it. He didn't even know what he was talking about. He didn't know how it was going to come together. They're just doing what God told them to do, submitted to him, following in his footsteps. God, I don't know why you're taking me this way, but I guess if this is how we're going to go. But then, in Christ, in sending us the Messiah, in sending us Jesus, the life of the death and the resurrection of Christ, the teaching of Christ, the leadership of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, the new life of Christ, the ascension of Christ into heaven, it was revealed to us. Nobody ever knew this stuff before. Nobody knew. But there was a particular point where God grabbed the edge and pulled it back and showed us not just a little bit, but the whole thing. Here's the plan. His will 
That is his desires, his plans, what he wants to accomplish, the way he wants to accomplish it. He revealed to us that which was previously unrevealed, but now has been revealed to us, his very intention, how this whole thing's going to come together, what is the plan, where is it all going. We don't have to be like the people out there on the earth. Oh, I just don't know what's going to happen to all of us. I just don't know. Better recycle. We don't have to be like that. Well, go ahead and recycle. It's good. We don't have to be like that. We know. He told us. We have the plan. What a tremendous, incredible blessing. What a tremendous blessing. And what is this plan? Well, it's according to his good pleasure. Oh, I love this line. It literally means because he just wants to. Because he so wants to. I remember, uh, some of you know that for Lindsay's birthday, we got her a really nice camera. It was something she really wanted. We, uh, the whole family had to get together. We saved a bunch of money and bought her. She was here on Sunday taking pictures that just look fantastic. I mean, professional level pictures that she put together for us to use on the website and that kind of thing. This is a real passion for her. You should see some of the pictures she's taken through her telescope with this thing. It's amazing. Anyway, we got that for her. We'd been talking about it for a year. And I think we bought that camera about four months before her birthday. It was on a one-day sale, right? And so we had to get it that day. I mean, for four months, I had the most fantastic birthday present ever hidden away in my house. I think I wanted to give that more to her than she wanted to get it. I wanted to give that thing to her so bad, I kept looking for excuses before her birthday. How can I get this thing? It's got to be, oh, it was just eating me alive how much I wanted her to have this thing because I knew she was just going to be overjoyed with it and I so wanted her to have it. That was according to my good pleasure, you understand. He wants you to have his will even more than you want to have it. He wants you to know he is so excited for you to know. People are like, oh, I really wish I knew the will of God. So does he. More than you. I meet people that are decidedly not Christian people, and they things like, well, I'm just, I'm just trying to do what God wants me to do, but I don't know what it is. Well, he's made it pretty darn clear. Be in Christ. I'm getting ahead of myself. When you're in Christ, there's his will. According to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ, that he brought about. It was his purpose to make his will known and to complete his will in Christ. If you want access to his will, there it is in Christ. If you're walking around wondering, what am I supposed to do? I don't know the will of God. Well, then get in Christ. There it is. How do you get in Christ? Well, you're going to have to get out of yourself. Deny yourself, take up the cross, follow him. Seek first the kingdom. Let everything else take care of itself. Like Pastor Paul Shepard used to say back in the day, you take, care of your, if, uh, you take care of God's business, he'll take care of yours. You invest yourself in knowing him, in being with him. You, you just set aside the things of the world. I'm not saying don't go to work. I'm saying you're going to work for him. Everything about you becomes being in Christ, following Christ, leaving the world behind for him, that's where you're going to find his will. Because he made it happen in Christ. He revealed it to us in Christ, and he's going to bring it all together in Christ at the right time, at a time suitable for completion. Remember, he has all wisdom and all prudence. He sees the best way for this whole thing to come together. It's a good thing that Wendy had some wisdom and prudence about Lindsay's birthday, right? He'd given her camera at the wrong time. But when he says, no, we have to wait, fine. She was right. She was right. Oh, God, I, I really need you to step in right now and do this thing. Listen, child, I'm going to do that thing, but I'm not going to do it on your timing because you don't have wisdom and prudence. So just hold on. Just hold on. It'll all come together at the right time. Just hold on as a plan for the right time, and here is the plan, ready? To bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth. That term, to bring everything together, literally means to sum it all up, to wrap it all up. Christ is the one who redeems. He's the one who restores. 
He's the one who recreates. He's the one who reconciles. That's what he does. He is the healer. He's the one who makes all things new. And at one point, all of the things in heaven and earth. That Greek term, all things, is really an interesting term if you really dig into it. What it means is all things. Everything that exists. Everything. Spiritual things. Worldly things. Emotional things. Physical things. All things. He's going to wrap it all up together in Christ. He's going he's to bring it all together in Christ. I'll tell you what, this is probably the most practical thing you're ever going to hear. Now, I know that, that we haven't quite gotten to the point where the rubber meets the road yet, and maybe your mind is going faster than this and you're already seeing it, but if not, just hold on, because I'm telling you, this is just about the most practical thing you're ever going to know or understand. And I'll tell you why, because there are people out there fretting and fussing and fooing, what in the world are they going to do? Their retirement port portfolio isn't building fast enough, and they invested in something they shouldn't, and now it's going down, and are they going to have enough money? Are they going to have enough money? There are people out there fretting and fussing and fooing because of the behavior of their children or because of the physical condition of their body or because of the political situation in the United States and they're wringing their hands and they don't know what to do and it's such a struggle and they're overcome by these things but not you, Christian. I grew up at the confluence of the Willamette and the Columbia Rivers and up until I moved up here, I have never lived off of, well, I guess for a couple years in Colorado. As a general statement, I have, I, that's, that's where I'm from. I'm from the Willamette and the Columbia Rivers. One of the things about the Willamette and the Columbia Rivers is, other than the dams that they've built on there, you could get on a boat at any point in any one of those rivers and take it all the way to the Pacific Ocean. I remember being a kid and looking up the river and wishing I could do that. Can I just get in a boat? My uncle had a boat one time. I'm like, let's just go to the ocean. He didn't agree, but you could. You could get on there. You could, you could jump on that boat down in Eugene, Oregon on the Willamette, take it all the way up through Portland, out of Portland, thank goodness, onto the Columbia, north and then west, and then you'd dump yourself out in the Columbia Bar and you'd be in the Pacific Ocean. You don't even have to try. If you just get on that boat, you, that's just, because that's, how the, that's the direction the water's going. And it's going there like it means it. That's why they dam the river, because it's really moving. And if you just get on a boat, you're just going to end up at the Pacific. Imagine with me for a moment that the Pacific is the goal. That the Pacific Ocean has everything we need. It has all the wisdom and knowledge we need. It has all the physical provision we need. It has all the spiritual provision, all the emotional provision. Everything we need is there at the ocean. And imagine for a moment that I know this, and so I get into a boat, and I allow that river to move me along through the, the, the busy parts and the, and, the, and, the, and the narrow parts where it gets real fast, and, and the wide parts where it's real slow, and through the confluence there of the Willamette into the Columbia, which is could be kind of messy, but I just ride it out and I just take this boat on down the Columbia, on past St. Helens, on past Astoria, and on out into, the river, out into the ocean. I don't have to do nothing but sit there in the boat. Now, there's going to be times where it's going to be real smooth and things are going to be moving real slow. If you go look at areas of the Willamette, sometimes it just looks like glass. If you go look at areas of the Columbia out there, like by the I-205 bridge on a, on a still day, it, it looks like it's not even moving. There's going to be times I'm just sitting there. Then there's going to be times that I'm going so fast. If you take the Willamette on through Oregon City on up into Portland, it's moving so fast, it's dangerous. I'm going to have to really hang on in those times. But I know I'm going to end up in the Pacific Ocean. I don't have anything to worry about. My boat is sound. My boat is fine. It's going to get me there. I'll be there. As I'm traveling along the rivers, I can look on the shore, neither ocean is all that wide. I can see the shore on both sides. And what I'm going to see is a lot of people running around fretting. How are they going to get enough? How are they going to make enough money to survive? How are they going to make enough contacts with the people they know to have the society around them? 
How are they going to fix the messes that have been caused? How are they going to put out the fires of the buildings that are burning? How are they going to educate the children for the next generation? How are they just going to have enough to eat tonight? I'm going to see every one of these scenarios as I ride in my boat out to the river. And those people are really upset. They are running around on the shores of the river trying to fix things so that they can get what I know I'm heading for already. I don't have to worry about it. I have everything I need on my boat. I'm perfectly safe. Not always easy. Perfectly safe. I can just ride in my boat all the way out to gain everything that I need to have while they fret and fuss and foo and go nowhere. Do you understand what I'm telling you? For those of us who are in Christ, we are in the boat He is taking us through this life. He is taking us through time and space and the universe and all this crazy stuff that we can't even comprehend. He is taking us through this to the place where we have everything we need. Sometimes you don't even feel like you're moving. It's just so smooth. Sometimes it's like white water and we're scared to death and we're hanging on for all we've got. But we're hanging on to the right thing because Christ is our boat and we're hanging on to him and we're going to end up right where we need to be. And it's going to be glorious when we get there. And in the meantime, while we're not there, we still are, it's just a great place to be. Because the people on the shore that are not in the boat, man, they are fretting and fussing and fooing and struggling and fighting and dying on the shores. Well, he's just moving us along. And that's his plan. It all comes together in him. Listen, people, he says, I'm going to reveal this thing to you. I want you to be in Christ because it's like a big river and in Christ it's all coming together. So just stay in Christ. Trust me on this, he says. This is the plan. Here's the problem. A guy named Abraham. I don't know if you really look like that, but I really like that picture. The little boy there next to him, that's supposed to be Isaac. You remember God told Abraham his plan. God revealed a mystery to Abraham that had never been known before. That God was going to create a nation of peoples and that from that, and he was going to bless that nation of peoples and he was going to put his name on that nation of peoples so all the world would know how great he is and from that nation of peoples there would come a Messiah that would fix it all. God revealed this to Abraham. Never known before, Mysterion coming to Abraham. And Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. This is actually what's going to happen. And it wasn't that Abraham, you know, didn't really believe it. It's just that there were some things about it he couldn't understand. So he figured he'd better have a backup plan. So he picked one of the members of his household, a man named Eleazar, and he made him his chief heir. Eleazar, he said, when I die, you take over. Eleazar, you have the role of the son. If there's a meeting I need to go to and I can't go, you go in my place and everybody will respect you. You're, you're, you're like my son. You're my heir in my household. And God came and said, Abraham, what in the world are you doing? That's in the Troy Revised Standard Version. What are you doing, Abraham? I told you that this was going to come from you. Abraham, he said, let me reveal just a little bit more about this plan you're going to have a son of your own from your own body god says you're going to have your own biological son he'll be the heir oh that's good abraham said because i have been losing sleep over this deal for the last 15 years i've been staying up at night fretting you said i'd have descendants like the stars in the sky i can't count those things but i can count my descendants zero and i've been concerned this whole time God says, Abraham, I told you I had a plan. I I told you I had a plan. You didn't need to get so upset. You didn't need to make a backup plan for my plan as though it wasn't good enough. Abraham says, okay, God, I get it. He goes and talks to Sarah about this plan. Sarah said, well, you might have a son from your body, but I'm not having one from mine, so you better get yourself another wife. And so he took Hagar, a slave in his household, and made her like a wife and had a son with her that he named Ishmael. Ishmael was nothing but trouble. From the time he was, he was a little bitty baby 
until the time he finally ab- left Abraham's house. He was, to use a Pauline term, a thorn in Abraham's side. You can read the story. He was nothing but trouble for Abraham. And God came and said, what are you doing, Abraham? And Abraham said, well, you said I needed to have a son, so look, God, I've gone ahead and taken care of that for you. I mean, he's kind of a pain in the rear, honestly, but I've done what you said. God said, no. I have a plan. I told you the plan. You will have a son with your wife, Sarah. I told you. I told you the plan. Just, just hang on to me. Now, eventually, by the time we get to Genesis 22, we see that Abraham has totally bought into the plan. He has totally released himself into this plan. He is riding in the boat, hanging on to the sides, heading for the ocean. And it's going swimmingly. Sometimes, sometimes it's a little rough, but he's got this problem, see? He's got problems in his household because he told all the other servants that Eleazar is better, and so there's this competition going on and pride and mess in his household. And he's got... Ishmael running around, causing problems, making life miserable for everybody. He wasn't a good kid. God said he was a wild donkey of a man. (sighs) Now, listen, he still got the plan, all right? Eventually, he was swept out to the river, out to the ocean. Eventually, the rivers carried him out to the ocean. He still got the plan, but he sure made life miserable in the meantime. He made life miserable for Sarah. He made it miserable for Hagar. He made it miserable for the servants in his household. He made it miserable for his son Ishmael, and he made it really miserable for his son Isaac, who was part of the plan. (sighs) Christian people, that's the problem. I just told you the plan. Honestly, you already knew it. But we better have a backup plan. I mean, I, I, I hear what God's saying. I've read all those blessings that are there in Ephesians. I heard what God said in Matthew chapter 7 about how we're supposed to seek first the six, how we're supposed to seek first the kingdom, just let everything else go and just invest ourselves. In. I read that. I saw what Jesus said there about deny yourself, take up the cross. I, I see all that stuff. I, I see how he said, don't worry about what you eat and drink and wear and all that and I'll take I see that but I, whew, I'm not really sure how it's all going to come together, so I better have a backup plan. And not only had I better have a backup plan, but I better help God out with this deal. I better help him bring this around. I better, I better start steering my boat, making some decisions for how this is going to happen. I better start rowing my boat, putting forth my effort on trying to get where we need to go. And you know what we end up with? We end up with Eleazar and Ishmael and Hagar following us around in the boat. That's not how this works. This is how this works. With all wisdom and prudence, him who knows everything and understands the best way to apply his knowledge. He decided that for us, who are Christians, who are in Christ, who have come into into all of creation since Christ has been revealed, that to us, he really wants us to know what's going on. It's almost as though he knew the world was going to fall apart. It's almost as though he knew cancer would not be cured. It's almost as though he knew our whole civilization would go from order to chaos. And so he wanted us to know ahead of time. This is, what's, this is what you guys need to know to handle this. It, it, he really wanted us to, even more than we want to. And so in Christ... He brought to us that will. He exposed it in Christ. And and here it is. It's that Christ is going to redeem and reconcile everything eventually at the right time in and of himself. And we we just rest in that. I mean, I'm not saying don't vote. And I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm saying don't get all Twitter pated about it. It's all coming together in Christ. Your politician can't fix it, but Christ can I'm not saying don't recycle. That's a good thing to do. Keep the place clean. That would be really nice. But driving a Prius is not going to fix it. Christ can fix it. Christ is fixing it. What I'm telling you is quit running around on the shore. Oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Get in the boat, hang on, and let him take you out to the ocean. We are to be in Christ. That's it. That's the plan. 
It's a good thing you made it simple because we're not smart. We are to be in Christ. And sometimes it's a cakewalk. It's just luxury. And sometimes we're holding on for dear life. We ain't got nothing to worry about. Put a smile on your face and rest in Christ. This is something you have. That the people doing whatever they're doing this morning don't have. This is something that you as a Christian have. This is a blessing from God for you. Something that's designed to make you full and healthy and safe and strong and content and even happy. You got the plan. You don't have to be worried. And when you meet somebody who's all upset and worried, they're going to be a little mad that you're not upset and worried with them. And you can tell them, yeah, but see, you're concerned about where everything is going. I already know. It's been revealed. And not just to me, but to anyone who's in Christ. So come and be in Christ with me. Let's all get on the boat together. The proper response to this this morning is to stop and consider where you are in this plan. Are you in the boat? Riding along? Sometimes it's really difficult. I know Pastor Jerry is. He told me as much. He said, yeah, this really stinks. This is tremendously uncomfortable. I do not like this, but I have never felt closer to God. I'm holding on even tighter. Perfect! Or are you on the shore saying, oh my gosh, how are we going to fix this? Or are you on the boat trying to steer, trying to run your own oars? God, I see what you're trying to do here. If you just let me take over for a minute, I think it'd be fine. Just, just let go. Seek first the kingdom. Deny yourself. And, and let him take over from there. It is a tremendous blessing of God that it's been revealed to us and that we know. And that should put a smile on your face and be one of the most practical things that you've heard yet in Ephesians. Let's stop here and pray.